Sydney Opera House. The Sydney Opera House is a multi-venue performing arts centre in Sydney, New South Wales, Australia. It is one of the 20th century's most famous and distinctive buildings. Designed by Danish architect Jorn Knudsen, the building was formally opened on October 20, 1973 after a gestation beginning with Knudsen's 1957 selection as winner of an international design competition. The Government of New South Wales, led by the Premier, Joseph Cahill, authorized work to begin in 1958 with Utsun directing construction. The government's decision to build Utsun's design is often overshadowed by circumstances that followed, including cost and scheduling overruns as well as the architect's ultimate resignation. The building and its surrounds occupy the whole of Ben Long Point on Sydney Harbour, between Sydney Cove and Farm Cove, adjacent to the Sydney Central Business District and the Royal Botanic Gardens, and close by the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Though its name suggests a single venue, the building comprises multiple performance venues which together host well over 1,500 performances annually, attended by more than 1.2 million people. Performances are presented by numerous performing artists, including three resident companies, Opera Australia, the Sydney Theatre Company and the Sydney Symphony Orchestra. As one of the most popular visitor attractions in Australia, more than 8 million people visit the site annually and approximately 350,000 visitors take a guided tour of the building each year. The building is managed by the Sydney Opera House Trust, an agency of the New South Wales State Government. On June 28, 2007, the Sydney Opera House became a UNESCO World Heritage Site, having been listed on the, now defunct, Register of the National Estate since 1980, the National Trust of Australia Register since 1983, the City of Sydney Heritage Inventory since 2000, the New South Wales State Heritage Register since 2003, and the Australian National Heritage List since 2005. The facility features a modern expressionist design, with a series of large precast concrete shells, each composed of sections of a sphere of radius, forming the roofs of the structure, set on a monumental podium. The building covers of land and is long and wide at its widest point. It is supported on 588 concrete piers sunk as much as below sea level. Although the roof structures are commonly referred to as shells, as in this article, they are precast concrete panels supported by precast concrete ribs, not shells in a strictly structural sense. Though the shells appear uniformly white from a distance, they actually feature a subtle chevron pattern composed of 1,056,006 tiles in two colors, glossy white and matte cream. The tiles were manufactured by the Swedish company Hogan Azab which generally produced stone worry tiles for the paper mill industry. Apart from the tile of the shells and the glass curtain walls of the foyer spaces, the building's exterior is largely clad with aggregate panels composed of pink granite quarried at Tirana. Significant interior surface treatments also include off-form concrete, Australian white birch plywood supplied from Wachope in northern New South Wales, and brush box glue alum. Of the two larger spaces, the concert hall is in the western group of shells, the Joan Sutherland Theatre in the eastern group. The scale of the shells was chosen to reflect the internal height requirements, with low entrance spaces, rising over the seating areas up to the high stage towers. The smaller venues, the drama theatre, the playhouse, and the studio, are within the podium, beneath the concert hall. A smaller group of shells set to the western side of the monumental steps houses the Ben Long restaurant. The podium is surrounded by substantial open public spaces, and the large stone paved forecourt area with the adjacent monumental steps is regularly used as a performance space. The Sydney Opera House includes a number of performance venues. Other areas, for example the northern and western foyers, are also used for performances on an occasional basis. Venues are also used for conferences, ceremonies and social functions. The building also houses a recording studio cafes, restaurants, bars and retail outlets. Guided tours are available, including a frequent tour of the front of house spaces, and a daily backstage tour that takes visitors backstage to see areas normally reserved for performers and crew members. Planning began in the late 1940s, when Eugene Gussens, the director of the NSW State Conservatorium of Music, lobbied for a suitable venue for large theatrical productions. The normal venue for such productions, the Sydney Town Hall, was not considered large enough. By 1954, Gusson succeeded in gaining the support of NSW Premier Joseph Cahill, who called for designs for a dedicated opera house. 
It was also Gusens who insisted that Ben Long Point be the site. Cahill had wanted it to be on or near Wynyard Railway Station in the northwest of the CBD. An international design competition was launched by Cahill on September 13, 1955 and received 233 entries, representing architects from 32 countries. The criteria specified a large hall seating 3,000 and a small hall for 1,200 people, each to be designed for different uses, including full-scale operas, orchestral and choral concerts, mass meetings, lectures, ballet performances, and other presentations. The winner, announced in 1957, was Jornitsen, a Danish architect. According to legend the Itzen design was rescued by noted Finnish-American architect Eero Saarinen from a final cut of 30 rejects. The runner-up was an entry by firm GBQC of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The grand prize was 5,000 Australian pounds. Utsen visited Sydney in 1957 to help supervise the project. His office moved to Palm Beach, Sydney in February 1963. Utsen received the Pritzker Architecture Prize, architecture's highest honor, in 2003. The Pritzker Prize citation read the Fort Macquarie Tram Depot, occupying the site at the time of these plans, was demolished in 1958 and construction began in March 1959. It was built in three stages, stage I, 1959-1963, consisted of building the upper podium, stage II, 1963-1967. The construction of the outer shells, Stage 3, 1967 to 1973, interior design and construction. Stage I commenced on March 2, 1959, with the construction firm Civil and Civic, monitored by the engineers Ovea Rup and Partners. The government had pushed for work to begin early, fearing that funding or public opinion might turn against them. However, Utsen had still not completed the final designs. Major structural issues still remained unresolved. By January 23, 1961, work was running 47 weeks behind, mainly because of unexpected difficulties, inclement weather, unexpected difficulty diverting storm water, construction beginning before proper construction drawings had been prepared, changes of original contract documents. Work on the podium was finally completed in February 1963. The forced hurly start led to significant later problems, not least of which was the fact that the podium columns were not strong enough to support the roof structure, and had to be rebuilt. The shells of the competition entry were originally of undefined geometry, but, early in the design process, the shells were perceived as a series of parabolas supported by precast concrete ribs. However, Engineer Sovea Rup and partners were unable to find an acceptable solution to constructing them. The formwork for using in situ concrete would have been prohibitively expensive, and, because there was no repetition in any of the roof forms, the construction of precast concrete for each individual section would possibly have been even more expensive. From 1957 to 1963, the design team went through at least 12 iterations of the form of the shells trying to find an economically acceptable form, including schemes with parabolas, circular ribs and ellipsoids, before a workable solution was completed. The design work on the shells involved one of the earliest uses of computers in structural analysis, to understand the complex forces to which the shells would be subjected. The computer system was also used in the assembly of the arches. The pins in the arches were surveyed at the end of each day and the information was entered into the computer so the next arch could be properly placed the following day. In mid-1961, the design team found a solution to the problem, the shells all being created as sections from a sphere. This solution allows arches of varying length to be cast in a common mold, and a number of arch segments of common length to be placed adjacent to one another, to form a spherical section. With whom exactly this solution originated has been the subject of some controversy. It was originally credited to Utsen. Ovea Rup's letter to Ashworth, a member of the Sydney Opera House Executive Committee, states, Utsen came up with an idea of making all the shells of uniform curvature throughout in both directions. Peter Jones, the author of Ovea Rup's biography, states that the architect and his supporters alike claim to recall the precise eureka moment, the engineers and some of their associates, with equal conviction, recall discussion in both central London and at Ove's house. He goes on to claim that the existing evidence shows that Arup's canvassed several possibilities for the geometry of the shells, from parabolas to ellipsoids and spheres. Yuzo Mikami, a member of the design team, presents an opposite view in his book on the project, Utsun Sphere. 
It is unlikely that the truth will ever be categorically known, but there is a clear consensus that the design team worked very well indeed for the first part of the project and that Yitzhan, Arup, and Ronald Jenkins, partner of Ove Arup and partners responsible for the Opera House project, all played a very significant part in the design development. As Peter Murray states in the saga of the Sydney Opera House, the design of the roof was tested on scale models and wind tunnels at University of Southampton and later NPL in order to establish the wind pressure distribution around roof shape in very high winds, which helped in the design of the roof tiles and their fixtures. The shells were constructed by Hornibrook Group Proprietary Limited, who were also responsible for construction in Stage 3. Hornibrook manufactured the 2,400 precast ribs and 4,000 roof panels in a non-site factory and also developed the construction processes. The achievement of this solution avoided the need for expensive formwork construction by allowing the use of precast units. It also allowed the roof tiles to be prefabricated in sheets on the ground, instead of being stuck on individually at height. Ovea Roop and Partners site engineer supervised the construction of the shells, which used an innovative adjustable steel truss erection arch to support the different roofs before completion. On April 6, 1962, it was estimated that the Opera House would be completed between August 1964 and March 1965. Stage 3, The Interiors, started with Yutsen moving his entire office to Sydney in February 1963. However, there was a change of government in 1965, and the new Robert Askin government declared the project under the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Public Works. Due to the ministry's criticism of the project's costs and time, along with their impression of Yutsen's designs being impractical, this ultimately led to his resignation in 1966, see below. The cost of the project so far, even in October 1966, was still only $22.9 million less than a quarter of the final $102 million cost. However, the projected costs for the design were at this stage much more significant. The second stage of construction was progressing toward completion when Yutsen resigned. His position was principally taken over by Peter Hall, who became largely responsible for the interior design. Other persons appointed that same year to replace Yutsen were E. H. Farmer as government architect, D. S. Littlemore and Lionel Todd. Following Yutsen's resignation, the acoustic advisor, Lodar Kramer, confirmed to the Sydney Opera House Executive Committee, SOHAC, that Yutsen's original acoustic design allowed for only 2,000 seats in the main hall and further stated that increasing the number of seats to 3,000 as specified in the brief would be disastrous for the acoustics. According to Peter Jones, the stage designer, Martin Carr, criticized the shape, height and width of the stage, the physical facilities for artists, the location of the dressing rooms, the widths of doors and lifts, and the location of lighting switchboards. The Opera House was formally completed in 1973, having cost $102 million. H.R. Sam Hoare, the Hornibrook director in charge of the project, provided the following approximations in 1973 colon stage I, Podium Civil and Civic Proprietary Limited approximately $5.5 million. Stage 2, Roof Shells M.R. Hornibrook. NSW, Proprietary Limited approximately $12.5 million. Stage 3, Completion The Hornibrook Group $56.5 million. Separate Contracts, Stage Equipment, Stage Lighting in Oregon $9.0 million. Fees and Other Costs, $16.5 million. The original cost and scheduling estimates in 1957 projected a cost of £3,500,000, $7 million, and completion date of January 26, 1963, Australia Day. In reality, the project was completed 10 years late and 1,357% over budget in real terms. Before the Sydney Opera House competition, Jorn Utzon had won seven of the 18 competitions he had entered but had never seen any of his designs built. Utzon's submitted concept for the Sydney Opera House was almost universally admired and considered groundbreaking. The Assessor's Report of January 1957, stated, For the first stage, Utzon worked successfully with the rest of the design team and the client, but, as the project progressed, the Cahill government insisted on progressive revisions. They also did not fully appreciate the costs or work involved in design and construction. Tensions between the client and the design team grew further when an early start to construction was demanded despite an incomplete design. This resulted in a continuing series of delays and setbacks while various technical engineering issues were being refined. The building was unique, 
and the problems with the design issues and cost increases were exacerbated by commencement of work before the completion of the final plans. After the 1965 election of the Liberal Party, with Robert Askin becoming Premier of New South Wales, the relationship of client, architect, engineers and contractors became increasingly tense. Askin had been a vocal critic of the project prior to gaining office. His new Minister for Public Works, Davis Hughes, was even less sympathetic. Elizabeth Fairley, an Australian architecture critic, wrote that differences ensued. One of the first was that Yutsen believed the clients should receive information on all aspects of the design and construction through his practice, while the clients wanted a system, notably drawn in sketch form by Davis Hughes, where architect, contractors, and engineers each reported to the client directly and separately. This had great implications for procurement methods and cost control, with Yutsen wishing to negotiate contracts with chosen suppliers such as Ralph Simmons for the plywood interiors, and the New South Wales government insisting contracts be put out to tender. Utson was highly reluctant to respond to questions or criticism from the client's Sydney Opera House Executive Committee, so heck. However, he was greatly supported throughout by a member of the committee and one of the original competition judges, Harry Ingham Ashworth. Utson was unwilling to compromise on some aspects of his designs that the clients wanted to change. Utson's ability was never in doubt. Despite questions raised by Davis Hughes, who attempted to portray Utsun as an impractical dreamer. Ovea Roop actually stated that Utsun was probably the best of any I have come across in my long experience of working with architects, and the Opera House could become the world's foremost contemporary masterpiece if Utsun is given his head. In October 1965, Utsun gave Hughes a schedule setting out the completion dates of parts of his work for Stage 3. Utsun was at this time working closely with Ralph Simons a manufacturer of plywood based in Sydney and highly regarded by many, despite an Arup engineer warning that Ralph Simons's knowledge of the design stresses off plywood, was extremely sketchy and that the technical advice was elementary to say the least and completely useless for our purposes. Australian architecture critic Elizabeth Fairley has referred to Ove Arup's project engineer Michael Lewis as having other agendas. In any case, Hughes shortly after withheld permission for the construction of plywood prototypes for the interiors, and the relationship between Utsun and the client never recovered. By February 1966, Utsun was owed more than $100,000 in fees. Hughes then withheld funding so that Utsun could not even pay his own staff. The government minutes record that following several threats of resignation, Utsun finally stated to Davis Hughes, If you don't do it, I resign. Hughes replied, I accept your resignation. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Utsun left the project on February 28, 1966. He said that Hughes's refusal to pay him any fees and the lack of collaboration caused his resignation and later famously described the situation as malice in Blunderland. In March 1966, Hughes offered him a subordinate role as design architect under a panel of executive architects, without any supervisory powers over the house's construction, but Utsun rejected this. Utsun left the country never to return. Following the resignation, there was great controversy about who was in the right and who was in the wrong. The Sydney Morning Herald initially opined, no architect in the world has enjoyed greater freedom than Mr. Utsun. Few clients have been more patient or more generous than the people in the government of NSW1 would not like history to record that this partnership was brought to an end by a fit of temper on the one side or by a fit of meanness on the other. On March 17, 1966, the Herald offered the view that, it was not his, Utsun's, fault that a succession of governments and the Opera House Trust should so signally have failed to impose any control or order on the project, his concept was so daring that he himself could solve its problems only step by step, his insistence on perfection led him to alter his design as he went along. The Sydney Opera House opened the way for the immensely complex geometries of some modern architecture. The design was one of the first examples of the use of computer-aided design to design complex shapes. The design techniques developed by Utsun and Arup for the Sydney Opera House have been further developed on Dare now used for architecture, such as works of Gary and Blob architecture, as well as most reinforced concrete structures. The design is also one of the first in the world to use Aerald to glue the precast structural elements together and prove the concept for future use. It was also a first in mechanical engineering. Another Danish firm, Steens and Varming, was responsible for designing the new air conditioning plant, the largest in Australia at the time, supplying over of air per minute, 
using the innovative idea of harnessing the harbor water to create a water-cooled heat pump system that is still in operation today. After the resignation of Yudson, the Minister for Public Works, Davis Hughes, and the government architect, Ted Farmer, organized a team to bring the Sydney Opera House to completion. The architectural work was divided between three appointees who became the Hall, Todd, Littlemore Partnership. David Littlemore would manage construction supervision, Lionel Todd contract documentation, while the crucial role of design became the responsibility of Peter Hall. Peter Hall, 1931-1995, completed a combined arts and architecture degree at Sydney University. Upon graduation a travel scholarship enabled him to spend 12 months in Europe during which time he visited Utsun and Hellebeck. Returning to Sydney, Hall worked with the government architect, a branch of the NSW Public Works Department. While there, he established himself as a talented design architect with a number of court and university buildings, including the Goldstein Hall at the University of New South Wales, which won the Sir John Sewellman Medal in 1964. Hall resigned from the government architect's office in early 1966 to pursue his own practice. When approached to take on the design role, after at least two prominent Sydney architects had declined, Hall spoke with Utsun by phone before accepting the position. Utsun reportedly told Hall, he, Hall, would not be able to finish the job and the government would have to invite him back. Hall also sought the advice of others, including architect Don Gazzard who warned him acceptance would be a bad career move as the project would never be his own. Hall agreed to accept the role on the condition there was no possibility of Utsun returning. Even so, his appointment did not go down well with many of his fellow architects who considered that no one but Utsun should complete the Sydney Opera House. Upon Utsun's dismissal, a rally of protest had marched to Ben Long Point. A petition was also circulated, including in the government architect's office. Peter Hall was one of the many who had signed the petition that called for Utsun's reinstatement. When Hall agreed to the design role and was appointed in April 1966, he imagined he would find the design and documentation for the Stage 3 well advanced. What he found was an enormous amount of work ahead of him with many aspects completely unresolved by Utsun in relation to seating capacity, acoustics and structure. In addition Hall found the project had proceeded for nine years without the development of a concise client brief. To bring himself up to speed, Hall investigated concert and opera venues overseas and engaged stage consultant Bench Launch and acoustic consultant Wilhelm Jordan, while establishing his team. In consultation with all the potential building users the first review of program was completed in January 1967. The most significant conclusion reached by Hall was that concert and opera were incompatible in the same hall. Although Utsun had sketched ideas using plywood fourth grade enclosing glass walls, their structural viability was unresolved when Hall took on the design role. With the ability to delegate tasks and effectively coordinate the work of consultants, Hall guided the project for over five years until the opening day in 1973. A former government architect, Peter Weber, in his book Peter Hall, The Phantom of the Opera House, concludes, when Utsun resigned no one was better qualified than Hall, to rise to the challenge of completing the design of the Opera House. The Sydney Opera House was formally opened by Elizabeth II, Queen of Australia, on October 20, 1973. A large crowd attended. Utsun was not invited to the ceremony, nor was his name mentioned. The opening was televised and included fireworks and a performance of Beethoven's Symphony No. 9. During the construction phase, lunchtime performances were often arranged for the workers, with American vocalist Paul Robeson the first artist to perform, in 1960. Various performances were presented prior to the official opening. After the opening, in the late 1990s, the Sydney Opera House Trust resumed communication with Utsun in an attempt to effect a reconciliation and to secure his involvement in future changes to the building. In 1999, he was appointed by the Trust as a design consultant for future work. In 2004, the first interior space rebuilt to an Utsun design was opened, and renamed the Utsun Room in his honor. It contains an original Utsun tapestry, 14.00 by 3.70 meters, called homage to Carl Philip Emanuel Bach. In April 2007, he proposed a major reconstruction of the Opera Theatre, as it was then known. Utsun died on November 29, 2008. A state memorial service, attended by Utsun's son Jan and daughter Lynn, celebrating his creative genius, was held in the concert hall on March 25, 2009 featuring performances, readings and recollections from prominent figures in the Australian performing arts scene.
refurbished western foyer and accessibility improvements were commissioned on November 17, 2009, the largest building project completed since Yutsen was re-engaged in 1999. Designed by Yutsen and his son Jan, the project provided improved ticketing, toilet and cloaking facilities. New escalators and a public lift enabled enhanced access for the disabled and families with prams. The prominent Paralympian athlete Louise Sauvage was announced as the building's accessibility ambassador to advise on further improvements to aid people with disabilities. On March 29, 2016, an original 1959 tapestry by Le Corbusier, 2.18 by 3.55 meters, commissioned by Yutsen to be hung in the Sydney Opera House and called Les Des Sangetes, the dice are cast was finally unveiled in situ after being owned by the Utes and family and held at their home in Denmark for over 50 years. The tapestry was bought at auction by the Sydney Opera House in June 2015. It now hangs in the building's western foyer and is accessible to the public. In the second half of 2017, the Joan Sutherland Theatre was closed to replace the stage machinery and for other works. The concert hall is scheduled for work in 2020-2021. In 1993, Constantine Kukias was commissioned by the Sydney Opera House Trust in association with Rem Theatre to compose Icon, a large-scale music theatre piece for the 20th anniversary of the Sydney Opera House. During the 2000 Summer Olympics, the venue served as the focal point for the triathlon events. The event had a swimming loop at Farm Cove, along with competitions in the neighbouring Royal Botanical Gardens for the cycling and running portions of the event. Since 2013, a group of residents from the nearby Ben Long Apartments, better known as the Toaster, calling themselves the Sydney Opera House Concerned Citizens Group, have been campaigning against four-court concerts on the grounds that they exceed noise levels outlined in the Development Approval, DA. In February 2017 the NSW Department of Planning and the Environment handed down a $15,000 fine to the Sydney Opera House for breach of allowed noise levels at a concert held in November 2015. However the DA was amended in 2016 to allow an increase in noise levels in the forecourt by 5 decibels. The residents opposing the concerts contend that a new DA should have been filed rather than an amendment. The Sydney Opera House sales formed a graphic projection screen and a light show mounted in connection with the International Fleet Review in Sydney Harbour on 5 October 2013. On December 31, 2013, the venue's 40th anniversary year. A New Year firework display was mounted for the first time in a decade. The Sydney Opera House hosted an event, the biggest blind date on Friday, February 21, 2014, that won an historic Guinness World Record. The longest continuous serving employee was commemorated on June 27, 2018, for 50 years of service. On October 5, 2018, the Opera House Chief Executive Louise Heron clashed with Sydney radio commentator Alan Jones, who called for her sacking for refusing to allow racing NSW to use the Opera House sales to advertise the Everest horse race. Within hours, NSW Premier Gladys Berry Jiglian overruled Heron. Two days later, Prime Minister Scott Morrison supported the decision, calling the Opera House the biggest billboard Sydney has. The NSW Labour Party leader, Luke Foley, and senior federal labor frontbencher Anthony Albanese have supported the proposal. The political view is not supported by significant public opinion, with a petition against the advertising collecting over 298,000 names by October 9, 2018. 2.35,000 printed petition documents were presented to the NSW Parliament in the morning. A survey conducted on 8 October by market research firm Micromix found that 81% of those surveyed were not supportive of the Premier's direction. This Wikipedia article was originally based on the Sydney Opera House, listed on the New South Wales State Heritage Register published by the Government of New South Wales under CC by 3.0 Astronomical Units License, accessed on September 3, 2017. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.